Hi everybody, welcome to the Gary Neville podcast on what we could call the morning after the night before, yes. really. Um, time to think about it. You were there, I was there. What, what have we made of England's exit from this World Cup? Oh, it's that hangover day where you've not even had a drink, where you just <laughs> wake up in the morning and you feel like something's missing and you obviously the tournament's still got a week to go, but you've obviously lost something because you, you just feel like you've got to wait that four years again and after the game last night I was quite reflective because I thought I'd watched a really good game in the second half I thought we played really well um, I thought we were the better team actually for large parts of that second half uh, but you then start to kick into missed opportunity don't you you start to think about the fact that they only come around every four years Morocco in the semi-final we had the game by the scruff of the neck there were moments there for us to go and do it and we, and we haven't done it so the, you're tinged with your know, great disappointment gutted for the lads um, I think over three tournaments now they've performed really well uh, but I can't, I, can't, I can't imagine how they're waking up this morning but I can't because we, I mentioned last night Martin when we got knocked out of tournaments in 2004 and six, I felt as though we were inferior in football terms those lads last night were passing it around they were patient in the play they were dominating possession they were sustaining attacks everything that we didn't do when we played in tournaments so I thought it was very different I felt very different about the performance I was watching than the ones that we had but the end result remains the same. Do you think the analysis will be kinder, though, because of that? Or is it seen as a really big missed opportunity? You talk about Morocco, who have a lot of injuries and some suspensions after their game as well. Not that they'd be a, a soft touch there for the taking, but it, it did look after Portugal went out that the winners of France against yeah. England had a real chance of winning the World Cup. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. it, was a, it was always felt to me like a... a, a look you're right when Morocco go through and that's not being disrespectful to Morocco because they could go and beat France and do what they've been doing but I just you're right I think it, we will look upon it kind, more kindly because I think this build play, group of players have restored respect I think in English football not just in our country but around the world there's a love for the England team the way in which the players behave on and off the pitch their, their results have been really good but you know, it will be levelled at them at some point in the future that they've not got over the line but I think they've punched at the weight and above for four or five years. Uh, if you said to me, before 2018 in Russia, we'll get to a semi, a final, and a quarter-final against the world champions and be the better team and get edged out because of moments in a match, I'd say, I'd snap your hand off. I'd snap your hand off. And the reality is we don't snap the hand off this morning because we feel disappointed. But I generally think those lads will... They'll be in different positions. Gareth will know the chance was there and he'll be like ruining that opportunity. The older players will feel the same because they'll be thinking Jordan Henderson and Kyle Walker will wake up this morning. He may not have even woke up this morning. It may have hit them last night. I might not be there again. And that, that, that's, that's difficult. It's tough to take that sometimes. I remember being in 2006 and feeling that. The younger players will think, right, let's come back again and do it next year. And some of the young lads will say that. But the older players and the manager will be thinking, will it come back? Will that opportunity exist again? But these players, I think, are in a position whereby they're talented and they will get themselves there again. Obviously, it's whether they can get over the line. Let's talk about the penalty because, obviously, the feeling was that if Harry Kane scores the second penalty, that England were the dominant side, then that they would have gone on and got through. Um, Lloris and Kane, yeah. I'm sure you were talking about it and we were all thinking about it. No goalkeeper in the world would know more about Harry Kane's penalty taking than his club mate. And... Did that have a part to play? Did the fact that it would have set a new record have a part to play in the in the second penalty? I mean, I think we spoke about this before. I, I am so unqualified to talk about penalty taking, the mentality of it. I never took a penalty in my life. Uh, don't pretend to know the pressure, the feeling, the, the experience that Harry or any other penalty taker was having. All I can do is pose probably a couple of questions. You know, did, did Harry feel like he had to hit it that little bit harder because the goalkeeper maybe knew where he wanted to go? I want, you know, that, cause he, did treat, he did seem to want to try and really thrash it. But then we always say, why don't they just smash it down the middle? And then the other thing was, the only thing I noticed was, and I said to you, you, you may be probably seen the, the replays more than I have, because after the game we were obviously talking just generally about the bigger pitch stuff, but I, something I pointed out was, was, was his run-up a little bit shorter? Well, it looked like that to me for both penalties, to be fair, and it worked for yeah. the first one. <coughs> Yeah, Do you think his run-up was a little bit shorter for the second one than the first? I don't know. I, I, and I thought they were quite similar, similar but yeah, okay. I mentioned in my commentary about the first one being quite a short approach. Yeah. You know? Look, he hits the ball so well, mm. I wouldn't have anybody else taking a penalty for my life in England than Harry yeah. Kane. He's our great goal scorer. 
Um, he could become the Premier League's greatest ever goal scorer. He's a wonderful player. I thought he played really well in the game last night, yeah. by the he way. D- he thought, didn't deserve what's happened no, to him. No, he didn't deserve no. it because I thought he played really well in the game. I thought his performance was, 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 was top-notch. I thought he had up a McCarner in that first half. I thought every time we got the ball into him, I mean, their, expo- their, their, um, their lack of composure and rashness around him was incredible. He just rolled. He kept laying it off. He was popping it off. Uh, I thought he played really well in the game last night, and he didn't deserve that. He didn't deserve that, but it happens. You know, Martin, 20 years of tournaments, 25 years of tournaments and pain. Even when we don't go to penalties, it comes down to a penalty. And I've yeah. seen many of my friends, colleagues, teammates have difficult moments with penalties. The manager that I, I was in the tournament when Gareth missed in 96, you know, he, his manager's experienced it. it, it you know, Jamie Carragher, I sit on television with every single week, has experienced that. I've got no concept of what they're thinking. And, what and there was feeling. a difference in this. It wasn't in a shootout. There was still time, actually. For there was. And yeah, yeah, there's still moments after that for us yeah. to be able to... You know, we had eight minutes of injury time yeah. and six minutes of normal time or seven minutes of normal time. We had 15 minutes left still to play. So it wasn't as if it was like a sudden death moment. But it was a big moment, obviously. Mm. Um, and... Yeah, it's not happened for Harry and for England on this occasion. But I don't a portion, there's no apportionment of blame or thinking, Harry, you've let us down. All that nonsense that used to exist 20 years ago, that's all gone now. You know, we're a far friendlier media than they were 20 years ago, whereby they'd always want to have a scapegoat at the end of a tournament. There's no scapegoat here. We've got a, we've got a great performing coach, a fantastically performing manager. There'll be some that might, uh, sorry, a set, of, a set of players, there'll be some that might challenge that in the next few days. Do you think days. Gareth will challenge himself over it? I mean, we're waiting. As we're himself. speaking, we don't know what his personal thoughts are about his future. He said he's going to give himself a bit of time to think about it. If you were in his position, given all that's happened and all of the progress that's sort of slightly yeah. gone downhill only because of the round that we, England yeah. has gone out in, um, that you might question that he's done enough or is he if, the man to carry it forward? If he left tomorrow, we'd say that Gareth Southgate has had a great, great England mm-hmm. uh, c- c- coaching career, a brilliant coaching career. I don't think that feels to me like the moment, unless Gareth's feeling that inside, that this is it, this is the moment, I've, I've taken it as far as I can. But I don't feel that. The tournament's in 18 months. It's only 18 months away, the Euros. It feels to me like doing that next one would probably feel like the right moment, if there is a moment, whereby you can set up a coach. It doesn't feel like there's anyone lined up. It doesn't feel like there's a transition in place. I feel like Gareth needs to take this team forward to one more tournament, do two Worlds, do two Euros, you know, he's got the backing, I think, of nearly 99.9% of the country. I think we all think he's done a really good job. And then let's see what happens after the next Euros, where my, he can maybe step up into the FA, into a position whereby the next 10 years can be looked at by him. Because I do feel like we need to keep Gareth in the England system. He's got so much knowledge of playing, of coaching the youth elements of it, and obviously now the first team, that we don't really want to lose that, I don't think. We have a great expression in football after a disappointment. We go again. Oh. And you want Gareth to go again. Yeah, I want him to go again because yeah. I think that he's, he's right that he goes again. Uh, I don't see there an, an obvious replacement. I don't think there's anybody better at this moment in time. I feel like that we're talking fine lines here that Gareth's had in tournaments. There are people who said in the last Euros that maybe he should have made a substitution here or a substitution there. There might even be people last night who said, well, why didn't he do this? Why didn't he do that? Honestly, that I spent I spent quite a few years on the touchline with Roy Hodgson and spent a few months in Valencia. I, I could never look at anything that I've seen in five years and think anything other than he's done an absolutely brilliant job for the country. He's restored pride in England. He's restored, restored respect in our game. The technical level and ability. The players are with him. They behave brilliantly on the pitch. They're leaders on the pitch and off the pitch. And I don't think we should change at all, in my mind, the manager of our, of our country at this moment in time. Well, let's look at those who are still here, and starting with France, who are obviously England's conquerors. What, what did you make of them? Not as good as 2018? No, not, not as good as 2018, mm. definitely not. Um, felt to me like in the first half, I felt like they were very dangerous, felt like they were sort of like a tiger ready to pounce. Like they got the goal, they sat back, and I thought, they're dangerous here. If Mbappe gets it, if Dembele gets it, if Griezmann gets it. But it never materialised. And I actually thought, to be fair, I knew they would concede chances defensively. I thought they were so rash. I thought that up at Meccano, Hernandez on the penalty, uh, Tukumani on the penalty with Saka, I thought there were some really poor decisions in and around their, their, their defensive third. And I thought that will cost them that against Argentina. That will cost them against Croatia if they play them in a the final. It could cost them against Morocco. 
you know, they were really bad decisions. The lack of composure in the defending, I think, would worry Deschamps. Uh, it would worry me. I thought we were more composed. I thought we were more patient. So and not much the, depth. I mean, Kingsley yeah, Coman always comes Coleman on. Coman comes so. on for Dembele. And yeah, that's, but that's about else. it. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you're looking at it and thinking, that's it. Yeah. Before the game, I said France have got the best eleven. We've got the best squad. And the longer the game goes on, I thought we, yeah. we would be actually in a better position. I thought if we went to yeah. extra time, we would win. Um, so I was a bit disappointed with France, but they were playing against a very good team. Mm. And we were playing against a very good team. And it was always going to be those fine margins, potentially, that were going to determine the match. Griezmann's moment of absolute class, a missed penalty. I thought the referee... I mean, Martin, we'd, we, you've, we've not criticised referees in this podcast and we've not done for years in the Premier League. We've maybe said moments of difficulty you know, where there's a referee... Yeah, and, and we've looked at VAR and the, the yeah, implications VAR, of that. But yeah. I thought last night that refereeing performance in the World Cup quarter-final was well below par. And that's me being non-emotive with my language. I would say, having watched Michael Oliver's performance in the Croatia yeah. game, who was a cut above anything that I've oh, seen, absolutely. he played the advantage for the equalising goal for Croatia. Yeah, we should play some respect in our referees. Yeah, Looking yeah. at what we've seen some uh, in parts of this tournament, I thought that refereeing performance last night was actually a joke. I thought, he got so much wrong. It was untrue. And that, that's not the reason England are out, but... If I was an England player, I'd be thinking, there was a foul on Saka before Prance's first goal. Kane should definitely have had a penalty in the first half. They're two massive moments that swing that game. And it took VAR to give the second one. And it took VAR to get the second one. Yeah. I actually thought last night the referee did have an influence on the outcome of the result. But it was a 50-50 match where I'm not sat here saying we got, blo you know, we got killed by the referee and it's excuses. We've gone past that. I thought it was a really poor performance, and I do think it had an influence negatively for us. Just a word on Giroud, who probably four years on is better, because he didn't do that much in the, in the no. winning of the World Cup, though he played. Um, he can still do what we've seen in the Premier League, and, and looked as though the Premier League had discarded him. So I guess for him, that was rather a special moment oh, to it's a turn up, be the winning. a moment goal. for him, and he scores those types of goals. He should have scored the one before. In fact, I fancied him to score the one before, because that was his type of finish as well. Um, there's an element of. These great players like Mbappe, um, Messi, they love subservient football players next to them that serve their needs. Unselfish. Yeah, that are unselfish, that, yeah. that, make, that do the job that they don't want to do and won't do. Um, and, I, I, and I've seen that all my career. That they, and Giroud is that perfect foil for Mbappe, for Dembele, for Griezmann. He just works it really well. He's actually defending on set pieces. He gets the goal last night. He lays them in. He pops it off to them. He... He's like Sheringham was to Shearer, um, like York was to Cole. You know that player that just plays off, that you know that, that 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 serves the rest of the team. And I think that Messi needs that. I think Ronaldo needs that. That's why they love. You know, Messi used to love Suarez because Suarez would do all his running for him. And you know, Cristiano, I think, has that element of him as well, where he wants to be the sort of the 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 the, 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 the pivotal player, and then the rest around will serve. And I think Mbappe loves Giroud. I think they actually gain something from having Drew. I know people say they miss their Benzema, and I can get that because he's an amazing player. But I think this but as, team, as a collective, as a group, I don't think they have missed. No, them. as a group, as a collective, and as a yeah, spirit, they're yeah. probably better for having yeah. Drew up there. Well, we can sort of touch on Cristiano with Morocco going yeah. through, and, and let's talk about the values of Morocco, who have, have played what you might call basic, sensible football with a, a fantastic attitude and the amount of blood and sweat that yeah. these players have given for the coach and for the nation and the whole Arabic speaking world really it's an incredible it's yeah. an incredible story Martin yeah. to see what, what they've done with Spain and what they've done with Portugal it really is um, I was thinking about when we used to sit in defensively sometimes with England when they sit in they also try and play out of those sort of tight areas in the defensive third and it takes real courage for them to do that and then they try and counter attack through it and I, I just think generally it's, it's, a, it's, it's the story of the tournament. It wouldn't surprise you if they went and beat France, by the way, if they did something. But I think France, I think Mbappe, I don't know if you thought that in the stadium last night, it felt like there were a lot of excellent players on the pitch and then this sort of like phenomenon that just felt like, I know he didn't have his best game, but there were moments when he got it where he just, and you thought, what is that? 
I've not, you don't see that. It's just, it's just something different. Right at different. the start. It's like Kyle Walker sometimes. nearly went out of the stadium with the first t- yeah. shrug of the hip. But, it, but to be fair to Kyle, that, that, that was the only time really that It happened. was, but yeah. you sometimes look at him and you think, yeah. I'm not sure that Morocco will be able to deal with that. Mm. So, and, that. And their handicap, because three of the back four, I don't think the original back four no, playing against Spain will probably Saiz play. Went off the Saiz went off, yeah. yeah He's so been they, strapped they, up to play. And will they strap him up to play? I don't no. know, but you're right. They've had injuries. They've had obviously yeah. tough games. Well done to them. One of the great stories of this tournament is definitely Morocco. Well, it's, we, it's history, isn't it? We've seen history. We've all been waiting to see when an African country would come through. And probably we were looking at more of Central Africa, Ivory Coast and yeah. Cameroon and, and nations like that. think it would be Morocco. And, and North African nations done it. And well done to them. Um, the other, uh, Argentina, Croatia. Um, let's start with Argentina because... They got through in a, a strange route, having been 2 0 up. Then they got battered by the long ball into the box. Yeah. And Veghorst, once at Burnley, yeah. um, scored those two goals. The second one was the free kick of the tournament, wasn't yeah. it? But the way the game ended, I mean, it, to call it a throwback, it's a bit of an insult to the history of the game, isn't it, really? It, it wasn't bit, very pleasant at no, all. No, they're barbaric, aren't they, a little bit? <laughs> yeah. it's like... Well, Alf Ramsey called them animals in 1966 after no, no. the quarter-final when England won 1-0 on their way to winning the World Cup. Look, some of their behaviour was, to be fair, disgraceful, wasn't it? I mean, yeah. some of it was disgraceful. I, I actually, you know, the way in which I played my football career, you know, I used to go celebrate in front of fans, but at the end of the game, I always went and shook the opposition's hand. You're always respectful. I thought that they went over the top the other day, the Argentinians with Holland. Uh, but that spirit, that nastiness, them fans that they've got here, that feeling, they've got it in them. The Argentinian defenders have always had it in them to be able to be nasty and to be fight and spirited. And they carry it with, they love their country. I always remember Gabriel Hines, I think I've told this story before, wearing the Argentina vest underneath his Manchester United shirt to warm up in. They feel it for their country like you wouldn't believe. I know that you know many countries will say the same, but they have something different inside them that hurts. It's almost like a hurt and like a... Yeah, it's something they have when they play football for their country, and they're bringing that into this tournament. The bench are all off, and they're all fighting, and they're all... It's, it, it's a bit of a mess at times. And, and the, the shootouts with players leaving the halfway line to go and... I mean, that was just ridiculous. Yeah, I'd never seen that before, no, it's ever. Getting absolutely ridiculous. And we've seen benches, actually. I saw the French bench yesterday getting up all the yeah, time. I don't know yeah. what's happening with that. Yeah. I mean, look, they've, got, they've also got this thing of beauty amongst... The, uh, the Beast, which is obviously Messi, yeah. which delivers these spectacular moments of just brilliance where combined with the tenacity and the sort of the horribleness of some of their play and their defending and the tenacity, it looks to me like it could be a winning combination for the tournament. It could be a winning combination. I just wonder how you touched on it there, the benches. Now we've got 15 substitutes yeah. plus the staff. Have we got an issue now where it's almost a war zone now, oh, where, but where that's emptying the benches is an American expression. Yeah. In American sports, they say, oh, baseball, they empty the bench. Everybody goes in for a fight. Yeah. And then there's but, some repercussions. But it's almost accepted. Are we well, going to move towards that where uh, this will be, be the norm rather than it, an outrageous thing that we've seen in that particular game? It's going to have to be dealt with. Yeah. Because... I, and I, I'm not. I'm not being a spirit killer here, but enjoying all the benches run onto the pitch for the, when the goal's been scored. Mm. I like that because yeah. I think of '99 and all our bench run towards Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and he scored. And in a big moment, I think it's right. I've done it with England v Wales a few years yeah, ago. There's last, five of you there in a last minute. <laughs> in, a, no, in a last minute winner. But well, now yeah. the benches are on the pitch. Yeah. Not just for the goals. They're on the bit on the pitch. If there's a foul. That's part of the um, the reason for adding on so much time. Yeah. Because a celebration of a goal is it's, now the chorus lines yeah. on, on with the stars. You, you know? can't take your shirt off, but you can basically charge <laughs> on the pitch. But yeah, I, I don't want to kill that because I think it's, it's really nice to see all the team and the benches celebrating together. But the benches seem to be becoming more active in the game. Well, there's more of them. I mean, yeah, is that a consequence of having? We're going to have. We still have nine subs in the Premier League. Is yeah. that going to be following on that we're going to have to? Well, I'm not concerned about the number of subs. I'm more concerned about the behaviour of the benches in terms of sort of like yeah, jumping. But b- because we can choose from all 15, yeah. you've got 15 available substitutes. Well, they're all running on the pitch trying to, trying to ref the game. Yeah. They're all running on the pitch trying to fight in the last couple of games. It's, like, mm. it's got out of control. But, you know, I want passion in football as well, me. I want there to be this spirit in, yeah. in the game. So I want to... But it, there's no doubt that it's just going to be a little bit over the edge yeah. in the last... In the quarterfinals, probably, whereby the benches have become too active, and it's been like, what are they all doing? They're all they're all on the pitch. They're all sort of pushing people, and uh, you know, you want a little bit of that sometimes in terms of you know, you want that spirit. Was it Tuchel and who was it earlier? Conte. Conte, the Premier yeah. League. Like, yeah. I loved that. Yeah. That idea that two managers are having a bit of a, a spat with each other. So we don't want to take it away from the game, 
but there's definitely an element of losing control of the technical areas in the last couple of weeks. But the Argentinians, you know, how they were, you know, with the with the with the Dutch with the penalties was that's that you can't do that, you can't do that. But anyway, that's I'm not getting too wound up about it. But generally, it means so much. The Argentinians, it means so much to them, and they want this tournament badly. Messi wants this tournament badly, and Cristiano, to be fair. I do want to mention Cristiano because I think that I saw that image of him walking in the tunnel crying. That was a horrible image for me. I, you know, I thought because that's that moment that he knows his dream's gone of winning the World Cup with his country, and you know we've all been there at the end of our careers. But he's 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 one of the greatest, if not the greatest. And that was a horrible image to see him sort of like that at the end of the game because he's you know he's had a, he's had a tough two or three months as well. There's uh, L M for Lionel Messi and there's L M for Luka Modric. Oh who is another, uh, because he's so understated, um, but we ha the last nation we need to talk about is Croatia, and his contribution is of a 21-year-old. <laughs> well, Martin, you know something? Croatia will dominate the midfield. They're better than the Argentinian midfield. Yeah. So th whether they've got the killer instinct up front and whether they can deliver in the moments they'll need to, well, I've, got, I've got a feeling they could dominate large parts of the game. We're well, talking about the losing finalists of last World Absolutely. Cup. Absolutely. Yeah. It was interesting. Ian Wright said to me, about 10 days ago, well, still in the group, he said, I think Croatia could win it. I went, what? They're nowhere near this time. And they're here. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, I never saw that at all. But do you know something? They've got a midfield that dominates the ball, that know how to play with each other. Can they beat Argentina? Yeah, they probably can. Because they've got that in them. That could that we have the same final them. as, as yeah. four years ago? We could, couldn't we? There's, we could, yeah. we could end, easily end up in that same position. Mm. Um, Modric is a star. How he's gone from Tottenham, he was a, he's a fantastic player at Tottenham, but what he's gone to since is yeah. unbelievable. And he keeps playing just when they think they have to take him off for extra time. He just dominates extra time and, he dominates extra and time, takes a penalty. Every, every pass he makes, Martin. It's a beautiful pass, mm. even a simple pass. Mm. It just feels the weight of it, the sort of the angle in which he sort of passes it to. The, he, he passes it to the right side of the player that's receiving it. it it's perfection. And much as would be made if um, Messi was to win the World Cup, I think it would be the same if Modric won it. Maybe, maybe less than a less no, celebrity. I think Messi winning the World Cup. Yeah. I think Messi or Messi or Mbappe becoming the defining player in the tournament yeah. will put them into that sort of that. You know, they're, they're there anyway, probably. But you know, they're, they're, it'll just even further cement their star and their status and what they are. And it does to finish. It does remind us of what England lost in losing that quarter final. The opportunity. I mean, Sir Jeff Hurst was 81. A couple of days ago, and happy birthday to him. Yeah. Um, but still, the boys of '66 are the icons for the history of uh, the England national team. And until someone takes that away, until we go and win a tournament, that'll always be the same. Yeah. The reality of it is the tough. Nature. Did you find that weighing on you that the, the history went? I mean, no, I never felt '66 was a weight on us. No. I never felt '66 was a weight on us. I felt the expectation of the time was a weight. Mm. The pressure, the media, the build-up, the, the heavy shirt. It was a heavy shirt, but I also think it was a very. Br when I look back now, from sort of what would be late eighties, through to probably two thousand and mid two thousands, I thought it was a very brutal press, very brutal. Um, it was there. It, it it could destroy you, and it was there to destroy you at times. And then the press, press changed. You know, post hacking, post closing down of certain institutions it started to sort of moderate and become a lot softer and I think a lot more articulate a lot more thoughtful a lot more respectful of mental health of what the, you know these stories would do to people um, and it's now I think in a better place social media has taken that over a little bit but you can you can get away from that I think I'm not a current player but just to ignore turn it off whereas the, the national newspapers just they have a big they have a big responsibility they're a big part of our, our our life in our country but i think our writers now and our journalists are, are, are a lot more yeah articulate thoughtful they're a lot more moderate in terms of how they present a defeat and what it will do you've seen in the last couple of weeks with the ben white and raheem sterling situations how they've been treated and dealt with and i think we do that a lot better now gary you do this very yeah. well it's always thank a you. pleasure thank you thank you martin